Well, we're now joined from Turkey's presidential palace by President Erdogan's spokesman, Ibrahim Kalin. Very pleasure having you on the Newsmakers, sir. Congratulations. You've won the election. But we have the OSCE election observers saying the election was not held under fair conditions. The conditions for campaigning were not equal. And the state of emergency was used to further limit media freedom. Do you accept that? And does that take some of the shine off the election win for you? No, no, actually, we have a long-standing tradition of holding elections free and fair. Uh, the opposition candidates ran their own campaigns. They had their own uh, programs, rallies, and, of course, they were covered by different media outlets. Uh, but, of course, uh, President Erdogan has been a very dominant political figure in our uh, recent history. And, uh, unfortunately, our opposition has this uh, habit of uh, blaming President Erdogan for winning every election to justify their own failures. Right. Viktor Orban, Ilham Aliyev, Vladimir Putin, Hassan Rouhani, Hamas, and so forth, all rushed to congratulate President Erdogan on his victory. Um, congratulations were slow coming from the West. Does that annoy you? Well, no, actually, they're coming in today. Uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, has called or is about to call today. Uh, Prime Minister May uh, and many other world leaders are calling in. I think uh, the Prime Minister of Greece and Bulgaria and others uh, either have called or are about to call. Um, so, I mean, it's a matter of, you know, scheduling uh, issues, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think to give the impression that, uh, you know, only those countries' leaders are calling President Erdogan, that, that will be... Uh, you know, against diplomatic rules uh, anyway. But I know uh, uh, the message behind this question has been circulated around, that is, uh, that Turkey is moving away from the West and this election, uh, you know, gives Erdogan another victory to take Turkey away, further away from the West, etc. You know, we've heard this argument many, many times. In this world of growing interdependencies, we do not see foreign policy as a zero-sum game. Uh, we have to invest in other parts of the world that is required by our national security. We are a NATO member. Uh, we are a candidate country for the European Union. We've been part of the Western Alliance, but that does not prevent us from uh, having serious engagements in North Africa, in Africa itself, in Asia, in the Balkans, or uh, in Latin America. We see foreign policy as a 360-degree engagement. Will one of the first acts of this executive presidency be to lift the state of emergency? Uh, yes, in fact, it's been on our president's agenda. He said this during the election campaign. Um, I think uh, the expiration date for the current state of emergency is somewhere in the first or two week, second week of uh, July. Uh, so when uh, the time is up, it will be considered. Uh, uh, and of course, we needed a state of emergency to deal with uh, the post-coup situation uh, in Turkey. Unfortunately, some of our uh, friends and neighbors uh, may not have understood uh, the seriousness uh, of the coup and the other uh, security challenges that we face from the PKK, from Daesh or ISIS, uh, they've uh, come rather slowly to its understanding. Uh, but uh, now we had to deal, obviously, uh, with this uh, urgent security uh, questions. Uh, but now it looks like, uh, you know, time is... Uh, ripe uh, to lift it. Uh, but let me also underline that the state of emergency was used to deal with security issues. Mm -hmm. It did not have impact on the business world or ordinary citizens. So we have a presidential election and a parliamentary election. And as we sort of unpack the details, one thing that's fascinating is that President Erdogan's popularity went up in the vote, but the ruling AK Party's popularity went down in the vote, and there seems to be a gap there. What does that tell us about the zeitgeist? What does that tell us about the man and the party? Is the man bigger than the party? Well, this is not something new, actually. President Erdogan has always uh, been ahead of uh, his party uh, approval ratings or votes uh, by 8 points, 10 points, you know, uh, in, in different elections. But the thing is that this is the 13th election, uh, national, local, as well as referendum, that he has entered and won. Uh, and he has done this with his party. Uh, and... Uh, you see, again, the overwhelming majority of the Turkish voters uh, has put their trust uh, in his leadership as well as elected uh, close to 300, I think 200, uh, 295 at the moment, uh, MPs to the parliament. Uh, and I think that shows really uh, remarkable political uh, leadership. Uh, given the fact that he's been at the helmet of Turkish politics for the last 16 years and is still leading his closest competitor by about 20 points, I think uh, th 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 this in itself is a huge success, and I don't think you can really point to any other living political leader who can, uh, you know, make a similar claim. Um, so both he himself and the party has a large appeal. And if you look at uh, uh, his support base, uh, it comes from every segment of Turkish society, urban, rural, uh, young, 
you know, uh, elderly, mid-income, uh, low-income, um, you know, Kurdish, Turkish, uh, Muslim, non-Muslim, etc. You know, no other leader uh, or political party has been able to garner this kind of a very diverse support base uh, in our recent history. So I think uh, there are lessons, obviously, to be drawn uh, from uh, the relatively low numbers that uh, the AKP has uh, received, and he has acknowledged this last night in his uh, mm -hmm. uh, in his speech at the balcony, and he said uh, he will draw the necessary lessons from that. Right. Now, the day after a free and fair democratic election in which President Erdogan gets 52.5%, AKP does really well in Parliament along with his allies, the MHP. Bloomberg headline today that I found, Erdogan triumph takes Turkey into the era of one-man rule. When you read that or you hear that, how do you feel? Well, uh, there has been a lot of uh, misinformation um, about Turkey's elections. Uh, Unfortunately, some in the Western media have uh, repeatedly failed to understand the social and political dynamics in Turkey. As a result, they have failed uh, in predicting the election outcomes. Uh, they've said, at least in the last uh, 10 years or so, that Erdogan is about to lose, his competitors are uh, this time really strong, uh, he will be ousted, etc. They turn out to be wrong, uh, and this is not any different. And that tells you something about their journalistic uh, credentials and standards, really. If you keep failing at the same thing, over and over again. I mean, if you were a meteorologist and you predict the weather uh, and every single time you fail to predict, there will be consequences. You will probably lose your job or something. Um, but unfortunately, uh, when it comes to uh, the, the Western media coverage of Turkey, um, the coverage is selective, is sometimes twisted, it's sometimes based on faulty information. I think, you know, giving all that and some to be honest with you, act as a political activist rather than as journalist. And of course, I respect serious journalists. I exclude them from this. Uh, but overall, you see the results. And the Turkish voters have voted for the new system. Uh, and they have continued their trust uh, in President Erdogan's uh, leadership. Um, and if you call the new system one-man rule, etc., uh, then you're not really uh, paying attention to the details of the new system. It's a presidential system where the separation of powers, in fact, is spelled out more clearly than the parliamentary system. There is a checks and balances system. Um, the president cannot decree any laws that will contradict what the parliament uh, will legislate. Uh, and uh, they can uh, uh, annul each other, uh, go to the elections, uh, but there will be some conditions and, mm -hmm. uh, and consequences to do that. The president can call for early elections, but that means that he will have to go to elections himself. And vice versa. Parliament has the power to call for early elections, that is, to remove the president from his post, but then the parliament will have to go to the elections. So that forces, actually, both the president and the parliament to work together. And if they disagree, and the disagreement comes to a, a crisis point, then they go back to the ballot box, and they will be... Uh, you know, responding to the people. So that's a, a political risk, but I think it's a democratic checks and balances uh, system. If you look at the judiciary, for example, who's going to appoint the key members of the judiciary? It's divided between the president's office, the parliament, as well as the judicial body. And that's not any different from what you have in the U.S., in Germany, in France, and, uh, you know, other countries. So when people say that presidential system in the U.S. is okay, but in Turkey it's authoritarianism, that's really a double standard. How do you explain that? If you, if you don't make that criticism for other presidential systems, say in the U.S., uh, in Mexico, in Argentina, or in France, where you have the semi-presidential system, uh, you shouldn't be making the same uh, right. uh, criticism uh, against the presidential system uh, in Turkey. Well, the politics here are never boring and they're always extraordinary. And I want to thank you, Ibrahim Khalin, for taking the time to talk to us here on the Newsmakers.